Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. A very warm welcome back to St Patrick's Church, Dunkmore, for this midweek time of teaching, reflection and worship. We we'll continue our series looking at the Psalms, tonight turning to one of the well-known and well-loved Psalms, Psalm 46, God as our refuge and strength. But before we turn to those words, let us sing together. shatters the bow and snaps the spear and burns the chariots in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our strong. This psalm falls very simply into three sections. Verses 1 to 3 talk to us about the troubled earth. Uh, verses 4 to 6 about the troubled city. And then verses 8 to 10 about the troubled troublemakers. And in verses 7 and 11 we have that glorious refrain which sounds a repeated note of assurance throughout the psalm. In that refrain we find a remarkable paradox that the Lord is both with us and our fortress. He is with us and we take refuge in him 
You know, it's very much the language of John 15, which we've looked at over a number of Sundays in church. That idea of you and me, and I and you, abiding in the vine. The first verse is begin with a picture of the troubled earth. Although the Hebrews never felt ease in deep waters, they did believe that the land and the sea were all created by God and controlled by God. That was a fact of faith. Earthquakes and floods and the like were a fact of observation. And so God's people could say that though all these observable things happen, or though the mountains quake, though the seas roar, we will not fear. They had proved the keeping power of God through turmoils even greater than these. Today, we might look at the natural world differently. We might understand cause and effect to to a greater extent, and yet it still makes us all the more aware of the immensely destructive power of nature. Israel's confidence is stated in the refrain verses, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. The, the Lord of hosts may well refer to the hosts of heaven, but why, why the God of Jacob? Not Abraham, not Isaac, not Moses, not David. Why the God of Jacob? Well, Jacob lived for 147 years and in the biblical accounts of his time, there's no record of flood or earthquake. In many respects, he was one of the few characters whose entire life was a, a gentle, quiet, calm, pastoral one. He's never recorded as climbing a mountain or going down to sea, but yet, behind it all, the story of his family is a story seething with cries and dramas, deceptions, feuds, rebellions, heartache, colliding personalities that roar and foam. It could be described as the mother of all soap operas. While his descendants were not always proud of every aspect of their story, they did recognise that God had taken such a man and such a family and brought them under his control, using their turbulence and harnessing their energies for his own purposes. Second section, verses 4 to 6, pictures a city which is under threat. Not just any city, but the city of God, the dwelling place of God. Now, scholars have puzzled over this. Now, when Jerusalem was threatened but did not fall, and some have suggested that maybe that it's referring back to the reign of Jehoshaphat, or Ahaz, or Hezekiah, and there's all, all different ideas as to what the Psalm's talking about, but it's most likely to be the time of Hezekiah, when the prophet Isaiah was writing his prophecy. Because during that time, an Assyrian invasion reached the walls of Jerusalem, but ultimately came to nothing. But either way, in a sense, it doesn't really matter to us. The message is the same, that as the previous section, that though the nations are not born, the kingdoms are shaken, God is still in control. He is in control in the world of nature. He is in control in the world of international politics. He is in control of all that seeks to destabilize us. From the New Testament onwards, the city of God has been interpreted differently. It's been understood as the earthly, not, not as just, just as referring to the earthly Jerusalem, but as referring to the heavenly Jerusalem as well. So therefore, when we talk about a threat to the city of God, we're speaking not just a, a, in historical terms of a threat to the capital city of the nation of Israel, but we're speaking of all that stands against the kingdom of God, all that's in opposition to the church of God and the work of God on earth. The church has been threatened by a flood of materialism, by an earthquake of persecution, by the tide of secularism, by the tempest of political correctness, and most recently by the pandemic of COVID-19. But there are three pictures which are to reassure us, to reassure the city of God. The river, the break of day, and the voice of God. In Jerusalem, there is no river. There's only a small spring, a small stream, the spring, the the Gihon Spring, just outside the east wall of the city. And Hezekiah 
Samaria built a great tunnel to bring this right into the city so that there would always be a supply of fresh running water. The siege that took place during his reign ended at the break of day. A new morning, a dawn, a new day. Deliverance. As people awoke to see their persecutors flee, just as God's people had earlier seen the armies of Pharaoh overwhelmed by the sea at daybreak. And God points his people back even further to a time when his voice first spoke and created. What he has made, he can unmake, including all the bad things in this world. So these are God's assurances to the troubled church in every age. His unfailing grace, his promise of a new day, and the certain doom of every evil power. And so the final part of the psalm invites us to come and sing. Come and see God's power, that power to destroy. It's not a welcome thought, it's not one that we often like to consider. We like to talk about a God of love, slow to anger, depicted by the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Yet, we've already thought that the context of the psalm might have been during the reign of Hezekiah, that siege by the Assyrians in the city of Jerusalem. And certainly, we've seen the destructive power of God applied against his enemies. But the psalm isn't local, specific, time-bound in that sense. It really is a much more universal picture looking forward to the destruction of all that troubles the earth. The ending of war must mean the destruction of all evil that leads to war. An act of God that skill will only take place on that day, that glorious day when Christ returns as judge of the living and the dead. Until then, he commands us to be still. And that's the heart of his message to us. Be still. Because everything we've read, every verse of ours point to that quiet trust and confidence that God's people should enjoy. And now he speaks to the whole world with his majestic voice. To the raging waters, be still. Recognize your creator. To all that stands against him, be still. Recognize the awesomeness of his power. His exaltation among the nations is, is but a future hope. But also it is an assurance. But we can be certain that in the meantime, he is a present help. I don't know of a single person who hasn't been caught up in some sort of raging storm in their lives. Physical health problems, emotional problems, relationship problems, financial problems, work problems, and the, the, the list goes on and on. We all have our crosses to bear, our, our challenges to face. And so often those weigh upon us and crush us down. They oppress us and bring us to the brink of complete mental, physical, emotional and spiritual collapse. And it's at those times that God speaks to us with these words. He is our refuge and our strength. He is our very present help in trouble. Though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains shake, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God who sustained Jacob is our refuge, and he will sustain us. And now to the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the ascribed as his most justly due, almighty majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth and forevermore. Amen.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.